Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we are going to discuss about Land Acquisition Act which current NDA government is bringing in. It has been tabled in Lok Sabha while pending in Rajya Sabha. To discuss about the issue we have with us Dr. Surjit Majumdar who is professor in Jawaharlal Nehru University. Hello Surjit. Uh, there was a colonial land acquisition act in 1894. UPA government brought it in 2013. Now the current government, NDA government is bringing it again with different changes in it. So what are these changes which this current government has brought in the Land Acquisition Resettlement and Rehabilitation Act? Well basically the changes uh, are in the nature of weakening the provisions, already limited provisions that existed protecting the interests of those whose land was being acquired uh, because they have increased the number of kind of the projects for which land acquisition will not be governed by social impact assessment, will not be require consent of 80% of the people whose land is being taken. Uh, it has also, uh, so, so, so basically the set of measures that are being taken are measures that weaken the protection for those who are losing land. Uh, whereas the whole issue of land acquisition and the need to amend the act arose out of a reality that the experience that people had with uh, giving up land uh, through the land acquisition process, that experience was running into uh, or led to a situation where it was becoming increasingly politically charged. There were political constraints that were arising in the process of land acquisition and the original land acquisition bill was essentially designed to try and continue the land acquisition process while somehow trying to address some of the political constraints of that. In essence, it was remained limited because it was not addressing the fundamental sources of the problem of uh, land acquisition. Uh, but even whatever limited protection that bill offered, that act offered, the current government is seeking to dilute those provisions. Uh it's also been there has been talk about that the earlier bill which was there it talked about acquiring which was acquiring the barren land while the current bill which is being proposed it, it talks about acquiring even the agricultural land which is available yeah so so the 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 restrictions on uh, on acquisition of fertile land have been also weakened in this provision so basically wherever the land is desired you can acquire uh, irrespective of what is the nature of the land, what is the quality of that land, which is not a very wise thing to do, but really if, if, uh, as far as agriculture is concerned. While it is true that people, employment wise, people have to move out of agriculture to non-agricultural activities, that is a necessary requirement. While that is true, it is not true that India does not need to produce more agricultural output and produce more food. So, to the convert fertile land into to other uses should be the last option normally uh, and avoid it as far as possible. But also government is saying that it is ready to pay four times the cost of the land which it is acquiring. So what do you have to say about it? You have to know what is the cost of the land and in any case the issue is uh, if one looks at the issue only in terms of what is to be paid as compensation then that is not a complete picture of the real problems. The real problems arise from the fact that you have a growth and development process in which those who are engaged in agricultural activity are facing increasing difficulty in uh, the livelihood difficulties because in agriculture is becoming increasingly unviable for them. At the same time, non-agricultural activities which would offer them reasonable, steady employment opportunities are not becoming available. So, in a sense, despite the fact that agriculture is not necessarily viable for them, it remains their only security and only source and therefore, there would be naturally a reluctance on their part to give up the land for other activities. On the other side, those who are acquiring this land and that is the experience of the last 20 years. So, it is not a problem that has arisen without there being a background that people have seen that 20 years of this process, land has been got cheap by uh, large corporate houses and they have made big killings on that, big profits on that. But 
there has been no return to society in terms of providing employment opportunities to large number of people outside agriculture. So, if people look at that experience that what has happened to people who have lost their land and what has happened to people those who have gained that land, the asymmetry in that situation is, is something that is naturally going to lead to questioning of, uh, of this whole process of acquisition of land. The way you, which you are telling that there is a problem of unemployment, there is problem like agriculture is not giving the output which it should give. So, this the way this land acquisition is, is being brought, government is also saying that it will increase investment in the market, it will increase, uh, install more uh, industries and it will gain to more, it will result in more employments. So, what do you have to say about it? Well, that's what I said, the experience, there is a background of the actual experience and what it shows in terms of what employment opportunities have arisen. And there is a relationship between that and the problems in agriculture. So you have to ask this question that industry in normal case for every rupee of output requires less land than a rupee of agricultural output requires. Urban living normally per person would require less land than living in villages because you much more concentrated living takes place in this in, in, in urban centers. So, in the normal course, if you have a shift taking place from agriculture to industry, from the countryside to towns and cities, if the workforce and the population is moving in this direction, then there should not be such a problem about land. Okay. Because the requirement of land for production is much less. But here you have a situation where actually industrial production is not growing, industrial output is stagnating. You are not having a situation where there is a great degree of urbanization taking place. We are still one of the most rural countries in the world. So, what exactly is happening? What exactly is happening is this is that you your development trajectory on the one side creates this crisis in agriculture. Now, crisis in agriculture is something that has a impact on industrial development itself by virtue of the fact that number one large number of people their purchasing power in the market depends on what they earn in agriculture because it is the largest employer in the country. Secondly, even when people move out of agriculture into non-agricultural activities, what opportunities they have in agriculture determines the wage that they can bargain for in non-agricultural activities. So, if agricultural incomes are generally depressed, then large majority of the Indian population will suffer the problem of depressed incomes. If large majority of the population suffers from this problem of depressed incomes, then industry faces a problem of not being able to find a market. Because if they are not able to find a market, investments are not profitable and that is the reason why investments tend to collapse. And that is the kind of problem that we are facing at the moment. If you look at the investment projects that are actually stalled, very few of them are stalled on account of problems of land. Instead, we have a situation where there is large amount of land that has been acquired, but not yet been actually used. Okay. So, land is not the real constraint on Indian industrialization. What instead is happening is that you are getting a tendency where corporate interests are seeking to make a profit out of simply being able to buy less, uh, basically make a profit out of buying cheap selling expensive rather than producing. So, if you, you actually invest in an industry, in bring about technological uh, productivity increases and you make a profit from that instead of that, it is easier if you can get some land, set a, be, do a real estate project or do something and then tell people that these prices are going to appreciate, you buy. And we have large number of real estate projects like that across the country in which actually people are not even staying. They are just investments that people are making. So, if this is the process that there is one set of people who are going to make huge killings on the basis of this acquisition of land and on the other side are people who are losers of that land, who are not going to find any opportunities outside of that, then naturally there will be resistance to that process. And that is what we have seen increasingly that there is resistance to this process of land acquisition. And no matter the problem with the changes in the Land Acquisition Act is that it is making it in a legal sense easier to acquire land, but that does not mean that the political resistance to land acquisition is going to disappear simply because you make an act. 
uh, yeah, I mean. So it's a it's a misplaced emphasis. That's not where the real problem is. Uh, keeping aside the problem of land acquisition in in the current scenario, if you look behind, if you look at our history, we have seen cases of farmer suicide continuously emerging after the new economic reforms have come into place. Vidarbha has been one among the region which has seen tremendous rate of farmer suicide. So, I mean, what are the reasons behind it? What, why is it happening when India being an agri uh, agricultural based economy, but still f and governments trying to bring in various policies which sub uh, promote agriculture. So, why is it happening? Well, the government has, the real story of the last 20-25 years has been a massive neglect of the agrarian sector. Okay. Uh, and the kind of in investment that was required in agriculture on the, on the part of the state has fallen victim to the whole thing of keeping taxes low and keeping expenditures low so that the deficit can be low. So that has been the policy for the last 20-25 years which has resulted in a serious agrarian uh, crisis uh, which is what led to of course a period of very high rates of inflation even in food prices. Okay. Uh, even whatever little benefits of that inflation trickle down to the agricultural sector, now things are turning worse again with particularly the unseasonal rains and prospects of a bad monsoon. The agrarian sector and agrarian incomes are already under great stress and farmer suicides actually have gone up quite significantly in the last year and in the, in the first few months of this current year. So, the crisis in agriculture is very deep and the crisis in agriculture has to be addressed not just because people, large number of people depend on agriculture, but the whole process of development and industrialization which would offer to the majority of the Indian people a route out of low income work is contingent upon dealing with the agrarian crisis. That if you are able to address that agrarian problem, then that by its effects on not just agricultural incomes, but on wages outside agriculture will create the conditions where it is possible for a broad based industrial industrialization process to take place which will offer opportunities of employment for people who move out of agriculture. What we have at the moment is we have a small section of the Indian population which is rising incomes which can buy all kinds of things but what it tends to buy are relatively luxury products which generate whose production generates less employment and high amount of imports. Uh, so, that demand is not adequate to generate the kind of industrialization process that this country actually needs. And if that problem is to be addressed, then agriculture or people sticking to agriculture or people you, wanting to retain their agricultural land is not the problem. I mean, lastly, if we see it at the current government and f they have given 5 percent corporate a relaxation in the corporate taxes and the way it's bringing various FDIs and privatization in different sectors. So, I mean, what's the way ahead for the farmers, for the movements which are there on the ground? I mean, how to resist this entire policy which the current government is bringing? Well, large segments of the population, whether they are employed outside the corporate sector or within the corporate sector because even those employed within the corporate sector are not getting the benefits of rapid corporate growth. Most of the benefits are being cornered by profits. So if you look at even wages in, in, in the corporate sector, they have remained stagnant for 20 years. So, most people in that sense are losers of this very process, of all these processes. And what is important then is for these different segments to come together to resist these kind of changes that are taking place. So, governments increasingly are operating when in government at the behest of the large corporate sector and foreign financial interests, okay. which is why you see that when you look at Indian, what happens in Indian parliament when any of these issues comes up for discussion, you can see that. So, FDI and insurance, I have one position when I am in opposition and I think everything depends on that when I am in government. So, that kind of thing reflects this that what governments do is being controlled by a very narrow set of interests and that is the fundamental thing that has to change. If the Indian people, so it, but it, it then becomes 
basically the indian people cannot expect deliverance from such governments the indian people themselves have to take the business of making their life in their own hands uh, that's all the time we have for today and we'll be coming back to you on such issues thanks thank you thank you for watching news clip